I guess we should start by trying to define what a family game is. And I hate definitions because they're never complete, but they at least give us a starting point. I think a family game is one that can be played by players of different skill levels. So if you want to think about the two major players as the parent and the child, or the adult and the child, that's fine. Um, the idea is to bring the family together around the table. And so you want to have something in the game that is for everyone, and you want to remove as many as, of the aspects as possible that are really bad for one of those player types. The adult is not a superset of the child. They really are two different kinds of players. And I'm often playing games in child mode, so I really identify with the child player. Like, I'm not really talking about age group, I'm talking about interest level and what I want to get out of the game. So what the child is really good at is playing and imagining and having fun. And what the adult is really good at is figuring stuff out. And they both kind of want to do that. I mean, kids want to figure stuff out too, but I mean, grown-ups totally do that, right? That's their whole job. Being a grown-up is solving problems, getting to the end of things, finishing projects. And honestly, the grown-ups are really bad at having fun. <laughs> and I'm going to talk a little bit more about what I mean by that. We're going to define fun a little bit later. But obviously you laugh, so you know what I mean. Like, the, there are deficits on the adult side of the equation. Um, so we want to play to the strengths of both of those. We want to make a game that most people can play together. And play together kind of means, you know, everyone's got a, a not an equal chance to win, but a reasonable chance to win. Um, that's not everything that games are about. But if you're going to be the kind of player who cares a lot about the winning, then you need to make sure that everybody in the game is engaged until the end. And that means that the kids have a reasonable chance to win, and so do the grown-ups. Do you want to just fire off some games you think belong in this category? Uh, Uno. Uno. Ticket to Ride. Ticket to Ride. Takenoko. Takenoko. What else? Older family games. Parcheesi. Parcheesi. Sorry. Sorry, maybe. Payday. Payday. Monopoly. Hmm? Candyland, right? Probably not. Um, uh, let's talk about Candyland. Like, grown-ups hate Candyland. There's only two kinds of players who love Candyland. Children and game designers. Right? When I played Candyland with my four- or five-year-old child, she reminded me why games are great and how grown-ups are bad at them. Because I'm a game designer and I want to get to the end but my daughter wants to role play. When I get stuck in the mud, she wants to go back and help me get out. And that's magical and wonderful. And we grown-ups have forgotten about that. So as a game designer, I think Candyland is great. Because it taught me what I have forgotten about what games ought to be like. The expectation of the child in that game is that she's going to play. The expectation of the adult is that he is locked down, unable to make any choices, and just has to watch the thing play out. So for the adult, Candyland is actually kind of a terrible game. Um, and I'm not telling all you adults to start loving it. There are real reasons why you hate it. <laughs> the same sense of powerlessness that the child feels when she doesn't understand what she's supposed to do is mirrored by the sense of powerlessness that the adult feels when all the decisions are made for him. So there needs to be something for both of those players or else the, the one on the wrong end is going to check out. I put Monopoly on that list. I put Apples to Apples on that list. Um, I put Yahtzee and Carcassonne on that list. And I put Rock Band on that list, actually, too, because it's a, it's a good example of a cooperative game. It's not a tabletop game, but it's a game that everyone can play together. And you can kind of sort of compete, but you kind of sort of can't, really. It's all about playing together and getting to the end of the song. Let's talk about defining fun. I've kind of got three different angles on that. My personal definition of play, which is very related to my definition of fun, is best imagined. If you've ever seen this video, I'm going to try to describe it to you. It's a very simple video, but there's this uh, metal or plastic sheet about this big. It's bowed up in the middle of the backyard, and there's goats, kids and adults jumping on this thing. Well, the kids are jumping on it, and it's bouncing around, and they're knocking each other off, and sometimes they fall off, and sometimes they can stay on top of it. And, and the kids are loving it, and the adults are just like, okay, whatever. They're bored by it. But the kids are playing. And what they're doing, that piece of metal is a system. And they are poking at it to see what it can do. And for as long as they are interested in the results, they are able to continue playing with it. Playing with something means poking at it 
guessing what's going to happen, and sometimes being wrong. So the adults feel like they've been on the plastic sheet and they don't really need to poke at it anymore because they know everything it's going to do. They're bored. Right? That's when play stops. That's when the game turns into a job. I used to play blackjack, I'm not going to say professionally, but very seriously. And for players at that level, blackjack is not fun in any way. It is boring. You do what you're supposed to do. I had a friend who said to me, craps is my game. And I said, really? I'm glad you like it. Here is what you're supposed to do. You should bet only the pass line and take full odds. And if you're in a hurry, you should bet only the come line and take full odds. And all the other bets are stupid. And he's like, OK. And a week later, not exactly, but a while later, he came back to me and he said, you know what? Blackjack is my game. <laughs> and I said, that's great. Here's how you count cards. Here's Bryce Carlson's level two Omega count. All you have to do is learn this and start playing the count and possibly betting the count, and you'll make a lot more money than you are now. Here's how you play blackjack right. And a few weeks later, he came to me and he said, poker is my game. And I, I, by this point, I kind of realized what was happening, because as I was telling him how to play right, all the play, all the fun, was getting sucked out of those games. Luckily, I couldn't ruin poker for him, because no one has a solution to that game yet. <laughs> poker is much harder. And of course, I love poker. Um, poker is a game that I look to every time I'm trying to design a, a, a casual or traditional or pub or family game and say, how does that game work? What can I learn from that? So luckily I didn't ruin poker for him, <laughs> although he has stopped coming to play at my house. <laughs> so play is poking at a system and not being sure what's going to happen. You want to be able to predict what's going to happen. If it's always chaotic and unpredictable, it's not fun. But if it always gives you the exact result that you expect, it's also not fun. And even those gambling games, which certainly don't always give you the result you expect, you're not playing with them anymore. You're not trying anything different. You're doing what the book tells you to do. My friend Dave Howell is a game designer and inventor and also a game critic. And he's got a theorem that's part two of our definition of fun. Dave Howell says that a game is fun as long as every player feels like they have a reasonable chance to win. And there's two very important parts of that that are kind of packed in there. One of them is feels like. Everyone has to believe they have a reasonable chance to win, even if it's not true. <laughs> then they're still having fun. They're still trying stuff. If they do have a reasonable chance, but they can't see it, it might as well not be there. If they don't have a reasonable chance, but think they do, they're still having fun. But as game designers, we know they shouldn't be. <laughs> After the first three rolls of Settlers, if you've generated no resources, you are so far behind, you cannot win. <laughs> but as long as you don't know that, you're still having fun. <laughs> the other half of that is reasonable. It doesn't mean equal. It doesn't mean that everybody has a 50-50 chance, sorry, everyone has a one in N chance of winning the game all the way up to the last turn. That actually is unreasonable. That means all the work you've done so far is wasted. Reasonable means if I'm a little bit behind, I should have a little less chance than you. If I'm a little bit ahead, I should have a little more chance than you. Reasonable is somewhere in that band between it's all a coin flip at the end and at this point I have no chance. And as soon as someone realizes they have no chance, obviously they check out of the game. When someone realizes that they will win, they also check out of the game. Neither of these players is really having fun anymore. That's Howell's definition of, of play and fun. And there's one more definition from Raf Koster. Raf is short for Raphael. And Raf Koster wrote the Theory of Fun for Game Design, which is a computer game book. Very, very good book, very simple. So he's talking about fun in terms of your competition with the game. Um, and for him, fun exists in this continuum between boredom, where you know everything that's going to happen or think you do, and confusion, where you have no idea what's going to happen. And in a video game, that ramp can be sort of drawn up, because as you learn more and more about the game, the game gives you harder and harder challenges to keep you in that flow state, in that fun zone. Tabletop games need to do that without changing the levels. You know, they can do expansions and so forth, but a good tabletop game adds that complexity as all optional. The complexity in blackjack is added as the player learns the one thing, he, le he moves on to the next step. So, okay, I know how betting works. Okay, now I should know how hitting works. I know how hitting works. Now I should learn how splitting and, and right? But even if I don't know that stuff, someone's going to help me. I'm going to do okay. If I want to get really, really good at blackjack, that leveling curve is there, but it requires much more effort and much more dedication. It gets me very little more uh, advantage. 
the very little more advantage for lots more work is part of what we're looking for as a way to balance the strategic decisions that we offer the grown-up versus the reasonable chance to win that we want to keep offering the child, right? The grown-up wants to feel like he's making some difference, that his decisions are helping him win, it's not wasted time. But the child needs to feel like that because he's not bothering to make all the hard decisions, because he's here to play and have fun, that he's not going to get totally wasted. That's why it's no fun for kids to play a pure strategy game when they feel like they have no chance to win because they just can't or won't dedicate the mental effort that's required to take the game seriously enough to win it. I play like a child. I refuse to take games seriously when I'm playing them. When I'm writing them, I'm crazy serious about it, right? But when I'm playing them, I really kind of want to be entertained. So if the game is too hard and I'm not good at it, I don't want to play it. I'm going to talk about what I think people want out of games. This is another set of theories out of computer game design. Um, they are competence, autonomy, and relatedness, and I'm going to define all of them for you. And you can think about how they apply to the games that you're working on, the games you play. You can also think about that in the context of the Autopia ride at Disneyland. Does everybody know that? It's the, uh, the little cars you drive around on a track, and there's a, the, you know, the kids can drive the cars. That's what Autopia is all about. And there's a metal rail down the middle of the track that keeps you from going too far left and right. And there's a gas pedal and there's a brake pedal. But the car just pretty much goes no matter what you do. I like Autopia because it's C-A-R. Competence is the first. Competence is the C. We all want to feel like we're good at something. And computer games deliver this by letting us win. And they tell us we're awesome every time we match three gems in a row. They make, you know, coins fall out of the screen and they play pretty music. <laughs> Tabletop games don't have all those tools, but winning is a feeling of competence. Little victories throughout the game are also a feeling of competence. Anytime the game tells you, you did good, you made the right choice, that's delivering competence, right? Competence in Autopia is the rail, the thing that keeps the car from going too far off the road. That's how you win Autopia. It won't let you lose. Autonomy is the sense that you have some control over your destiny. And unfortunately, it's the exact opposite of competence. Because we're in a, when you're in a new environment, you don't have the skills required to actually win there. So if, I just, if, if the game is just you win, and you turn it on, and it says you win, you don't feel like you did anything. You want to have at least the illusion of making choices. That's why you have to look for the only match on the match three game. You have to look all over the board and find it. It won't just flip it for you, because this is the only one. Here you go, right? You need to feel like you're making decisions about the outcome of the game. And that's the steering wheel. That's the gas pedal. That's the brake pedal. Those are the controls and the options that the game gives you to steer all the way over here as long as you want until you hit the rail. Oh, actually, now all the way over as long as here until you hit the rail. You can go. You can stop. But you can't stop for long because the car behind you is going to get angry. You can go some more. Autonomy is all the strategic decisions that we make in games. It's also all the non-strategic decisions that we think are strategic. Craps has only one strategic decision. Don't play craps. <laughs> if you have to make another one, it is take only the full odds on the pass bet and do nothing else. And uh, receive as many free drinks as this will earn you. <laughs> but people like to play craps because they feel like the decisions they are making are affecting the outcome. They like to buy all the numbers and make the crazy bets. And as a rule of thumb, if you don't know craps, the farther you have to throw your money, the less of it is coming back to you. <laughs> I talked to somebody on the airplane on the way to Vegas, and he said, I have a great strategy for craps. And because I am a game designer, I did not say, no, you don't, you idiot. <laughs> I said, that is great. What is it? And he basically described to me a money management strategy, which is where if he's running low on money, he bets less. And if he's winning, he bets more. And that's great. But it's not a strategy for craps. It's a strategy for managing your bankroll. But what was important to him was that he had autonomy. What was important to him is that he could make decisions about how, whether or not he was winning more and less money. That was the steering wheel for craps, for him. As a game designer, I know that's not really attached to anything. <laughs> but as long as I feel like it is, the game is still fun. The R in C-A-R is relatedness. And this is one of the hardest things to deliver in a family game. Relatedness is how we are interacting, how we are related to the other people in the real world. 
it's important within the game, but it's also important outside of the game. I play games with friends because I like my friends. And I like to talk with my friends and joke with my friends. And whether the jokes are about the game or not, we're together and we're having fun. That relates me with them. They like the same things that I like, so we are related. If I'm playing in an arcade, I want to get on the high scoreboard. Because those initials on that high scoreboard are how I relate to the people in my neighborhood, to the other people who come to this arcade. This is writ large in Xbox Live because it's one giant high scoreboard that proposes to relate everyone, but instead just tells you how much you suck. <laughs> but you can relate to other people when you blow them up repeatedly online. I mean, you can do a little bit of that. The relatedness in Autopia is the passenger seat because that's where your parent sits and watches you drive the car. If your game isn't delivering that, you're doing something wrong. It's only going to appeal to people who really want to just get into the game and think and be in the game. Everyone else doesn't see the point of playing. My grandfather hated games because he just didn't see the point. So I would make him play and he would cheat and win or lose or he didn't care and then he would stop playing. He would sabotage the system because he didn't think it was fun. And I think part of it was because he just didn't see why it was important. And there's a lot of people who just don't see why games are important. And those, some of those people only find gambling games important because it is the money, it is the, the, the perpetuated score that makes the gambling game relevant to the rest of their lives. And possibly related to other people, but mostly that, you know, if you don't really know or care why you're playing, if you, don't, you can't relate it to the rest of your life, then it feels sort of pointless. Gamers are happy to abstract all that away and enjoy winning the game for the sake of the game. Non-gamers, not so much. You need to give them a better reason to care. And storytelling is one way to do that. Like, I like to write games that have good jokes and good stories and like I'm pretending to be a bad person doing bad things because that's fun. And that's a way to relate to my friends who also want to do the same thing. So that's the car. I have a specific list here of things that I think belong in a family game, things that you should think about when you're crafting a family game specifically. And the first one on my list is clarity. It's kind of like simplicity, but clarity is what am I trying to do and how do I do it? If a game has a metaphor, if a game has a theme that clearly explains what you're trying to do and how you do it, that helps a lot. So that's why games with themes are typically more attractive to casual gamers than games without. For example, Monopoly. Game designers love to hate Monopoly until they become super game designers and then they love it again. <laughs> Monopoly's not really a game, it's an activity. That's one of the things you have to understand about Monopoly. My friend came back, uh, one of my co-designers on Kill Dr. Lucky came back from Christmas a couple years ago and said his niece really wanted to play Monopoly. And he said, that game takes too long. And she says, you don't finish Monopoly, you just play. <laughs> Monopoly grabs you, and here's why. It's about bankrupting everybody. <laughs> like, as soon as you're born, you start learning what this culture is about. It's about making money. And if I told you we're going to play a game where the richest person wins and everyone else loses, you're going to say, I understand that completely. Let's play. <laughs> if I said you're settling an island and you have to make sheep and wheat into roads, you're going to say, what? <laughs> but if I say, get rich, bankrupt everybody else, you're going to say, let's play. I don't care how it works, I'm going to start. So Monopoly satisfies that in the clarity of its purpose. Now, the rules are a little complicated, but that's actually uh, fixed by one of the other things on this list. And the thing is open information. Family games don't have to have open information, but it really helps if they do, because if everything about everyone's game state is visible, then the good players can help the bad players make their first few decisions. Um, in, uh, in talking about gambling games, I always say that, that easy decisions are really important. Gamers like to think that they don't need any easy, easy decisions. Easy decisions are stupid. But easy decisions are breadcrumbs teaching you how to make the hard ones. Monopoly has lots of hard decisions. But because everything is out in the open, the parents can help the children or the hardcore gamers can help the casual gamers make those first few decisions and sort of bootstrap them into the game. Whereas if you're playing a game with secret information, you wind up either like playing open-handed, which almost no one really wants to do, or giving people a lot of contingent advice. Well, if you've got two sevens down there, you should probably raise, but not raise too much. But if you have a 7 and an 8, then you have a straight draw. So that means like you just start giving a bunch of ifs. And that kind of advice is impossible for the new player to parse. It's rather just saying, well, you, you have lots of money, so go ahead and buy, buy, buy a Baltic Avenue. Don't put it up for auction. You know, that's, that's open information. 
Something else in the, in the open information vein is uh, the bridge story, which is basically show people the guts. Show them behind the curtain. Don't conceal it. It has more to do with computer games where it's easier to conceal the mechanics. But the bridge story is this. I'm driving across town. I see the sign that says the 520 bridge is going to be closed in 15 minutes. It's going to open up for a, a, car, a, a boat to go through or whatever. And I'm exactly 15 minutes away from the bridge, and so I have to make a decision. Should I try to drive over the bridge and hope I get there before it closes? Or should I take the long way around and it costs me an extra half an hour? And I say, I'll go for the bridge. If it closes, I'll stop. I'll enjoy the weather. I'll check my email. Everything will be fine. But all the way there, I'm tense. Bridge might close. Bridge might close. And I get there, and it doesn't close, and I get through it. And I'm like, yes! <laughs> and then there's the guy in the car next to me. He didn't see the sign. So his two possible outcomes were driving across the bridge like he always does or being surprised and pissed off. He kind of got caught when the bridge closed and said, damn it, the world hates me. And it's not that the world hates him, it's that he didn't see the sign. He didn't make the choice. We can do that in games. We can show people how the games work and let them understand the choices that they're making, or we can hide the mechanics and try to make it easier for them, and then when they get buffeted by the, by the results, they don't know what's happening. There was an article, and I can't cite it because I don't remember who did it or when it was or anything like that, but it was about luck. Are lucky people really lucky because they kind of seem to be? And they separated the group into people who describe themselves as lucky and people who describe themselves as not lucky. And they gave them a newspaper and said, tell me how many pictures are in this newspaper. And it was something like 37, and everyone kind of flipped through the paper and kind of got it right, more or less. But the people in the lucky group had a tendency to notice the headline on the front page that said, there are 37 pictures in this newspaper. <laughs> and the people in the unlucky group tended to just do what they were told and count the pictures. So luck has a lot to do with just paying attention. Now I see the sign, the other guy doesn't see the sign, so I feel lucky that I got across the bridge. And his only result is he can feel normal or unlucky because he got stopped. As game designers, our job is to make sure that that headline is easy to read tell people what they're up against so they can make the right decisions. I have luck and strategy on my list, things that family games need. And as a general rule in game design, you should understand that those are independent variables. A lot of people tend to rate games on a linear scale between luck on one side and skill or strategy on the other side. But really, that doesn't paint a very strong picture because tic-tac-toe has zero luck, and so does chess, and they are not really very the same. Huh. And Candyland has no, no, no skill and is all luck. And so does a coin flip. But they also are really not the same. Because in Candyland, you feel trapped. In a coin flip, you don't have time. Games that are pure luck are best when they have very quick resets. And that's why gambling games are like six seconds long or one minute long. If you have a fully luck-driven game and it lasts a half an hour, you are disappointing some people because you can fall behind very early and do nothing to get yourself caught up. You have no hope of catching up. That's why Candyland is so frustrating for the grown-ups. The kids just want to watch it happen, so they don't care. But the grown-ups, come on, let's do a hard reset or something. So as independent variables, luck can be very low, it can be very high. There's, like I said, zero luck in those, those, ab those, those full abstract strategy games I was talking about. There is a whole lot of luck. There's a whole lot of game decisions that are made by a chaotic variable in, for instance... Warhammer 40K. You roll a lot of dice in that game. Things beyond your control. And, you know, as a, as a separate topic, they don't tend to balance out. If you think that they do, they don't. Adding more luck to a game doesn't let people catch up. You need some other mechanic or some other strategy element or something that lets people who fall behind catch up. There is no catching up just by rolling more dice. Games can have a little bit of strategy, like tic-tac-toe. They can have a lot of strategy, like chess. Um, again, Warhammer 40K has a lot of strategy, and that's what saves it, because you have to make a lot of decisions, um, usually before you roll the dice, which is frustrating, but you make a lot of decisions which can, which can make up for bad rolls. The games we want to do in the family category have a little bit of both. You don't want to have too much of either one, 
If you have too much luck, you're going to frustrate the people who want to make plans. If you have too much thinking, you want to, you're going to frustrate the people who just want to roll the dice and have fun. So they tend to be pretty low on both scales. Yeah? Is there a place to go to find out if your idea has already been done? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's so many questions inside that question. <laughs> your idea has already been done. <laughs> From a certain perspective, yes, that's true. From another perspective, everything is new. Um, and in fact, uh, related to that, you yourself have two brains. You have an adult brain and a child brain. The adult brain is really good at getting stuff done and thinking about stuff, figuring stuff out, and that adult brain needs to leave the room when you're coming up with a new idea. The child brain thinks everything is awesome. <laughs> everything is new. Zombies are amazing. Pirates are amazing. I want to make a game about zombies and pirates. And the problem with being an adult is that the adult brain is always there to say, you know, there probably already is one of those. It's going to shut down the creativity before the creativity even gets a chance to go someplace new. My, my daughter, what was it? I think, that, I, think, I think this is how it went. She came to me and she said, I had a dream last night. I was in South America and we were hunting lions. And the adult brain in me said, there are no lions in South America. <laughs> but... If I said that, I wouldn't have heard the rest of the dream. That's the problem with the adult brain. Shut up. Leave the room. When the kid brain has finally latched on to what's amazing about zombies and pirates, when the kid brain can really articulate why this is great and what they want to do and what they want their game to be about, then the adult comes into the room and says, all right, well, son, if you really want to do that, here's how you do it. Here's how you finish it. Here's how you test it. Here's how you build prototypes and whatever. So you need them both. But... The reason that they say there's no bad ideas in brainstorming is not just because it's always hilariously wrong, but <laughs> because a, an idea that sounds bad might actually be good. It just needs to be given some time to develop. As far as resources for determining if your thing has been done or not, I, I find like that is, that is like a painful way to approach it. That's the adult stepping in and saying, hey, you know, maybe we shouldn't be creative after all because it's been done. You could do a trademark search and find out if your exact name has been registered or something like that. But yes, there's game about zombies. Yes, there's games about pirates. Yes, there's games about zombie pirates. But the thing that you want to do with this, with this IP, the thing that you think is great and new about this is probably great and new. And if you develop it enough, it will stand out from those things that can superficially be said to be the same. So my, the approach of saying, well, I have now seen everything that has been done. I, am now, I now have permission to do a new thing is frustrating and you'll never ever win that game. Um, there, there's, if you look far enough back in history, you're going to find all kinds of other stuff that no one even knows about now that has also already been done. And it's easy to shut yourself down with a fresh idea just out of the idea bag by saying, oh, that reminds me of X, right? Now, if you're just ripping off somebody's game, don't do that, but that's somebody else's. <laughs> Thank you very much. I know you want to go to the concert. I, I appreciate your time and uh, I'll be around all day today and tomorrow playing games, so come find me and do that thing. <laughs>